Hi everybody and welcome or welcome back to Murder at Bedtime. I'm Lyndon and you know I think you're what all awesome. Before I get into the waffle free story, a quick shout out to my favourite podcast at the moment, Beth and Bailey at True Crime B&B, Cindy and Diva at Twisted Listers, Anne and Karen at Sugar Coated Murders, Debbie Q at The Right Shoe, Jen and Megan at You're Gonna Die Out There, and Rebecca at West London Witch. And with that, let's get on with Murder in the Potteries. Frederick Cuthbert Wilshaw was on his way home from his club. He always popped in for a game of cards after finishing his day at the pottery firm he owned of Wiltshaw and Robinson in Stoke-on-Trent in Staffordshire. Now, for anybody outside the UK who probably won't know, Staffordshire is known as the Potteries as it was the centre of production of pottery and ceramics for many years. At the time, Wilshaw and Robinson was well known for its brightly coloured Carlton ware. As Frederick arrived home to the 14-room villa named Esteril in Barlaston, he shared with his wife Alice on the early evening of 16th of July 1952, he would not be prepared for what he would find inside the hallway. In that hallway, 62-year-old Alice was laid on the floor, almost unrecognisable from the beating that she had sustained. Her head had been completely smashed in. Frederick could see straight away that she was dead, but his first call was to a Dr Brown, a friend who lived locally, and he came straight round confirming that his wife was deceased. Then Frederick made a call to PC John Bingham, the local Barlaston policeman. He informed Detective Sergeant Alf Robbins at Stone Police Station and he and his superior officer, Superintendent William Crook, attended the scene. They arrived barely half an hour after Frederick's call. Now, Alf has always refused to divulge exactly what he saw there, but he did say it was a terrible sight. The initial evidence led police to believe that the attack on 62-year-old Alice had started in the kitchen, most probably while she was preparing dinner. The assailant had selected two heavy logs from the scullery and savagely beaten her around the head until he thought she was either unconscious or dead. It was thought by Dr Brown that the attack had happened initially in the kitchen, then the assailant made their way upstairs and ransacked the Wiltshire's bedroom, finding Alice's jewellery box. Then going back downstairs, where he found that Alice had regained consciousness and had managed to stagger to her feet and make her way into the hallway. Bloody hand marks were all over the walls from kitchen to hall showing this. Once again, the assailant brutally attacked her with anything at hand. Ornaments, vases, saucepans, a copper bowl and a hammer. Finally finishing off the very brave plucky lady with a three foot iron poker with a big hook on the end of it. Where he beat her around the head and face, finally stabbing her through the head with it and then stabbing her several times in the stomach. Fortunately, evidence was found. Robbins found wet footprints on the kitchen floor with a distinctive horizontal pattern on them. He went outside and found a dustbin lid to protect them with. Then a police dog called Rex arrived. He found a pair of blood-stained hogskin gloves in a rose bush with a tear in the left hand one's thumb. Chief Detective Superintendent Lockley straight away decided it was more than likely someone who knew the Wiltshaws and the layout of the house, so he decided to check out staff of the house, both past and present, and interview them. And this they did, with the exception of one man, a chauffeur and odd job man, 
29-year-old Leslie Green, who had been dismissed just a matter of weeks ago for using his employer's car for his own use without asking permission. A couple of days into the search for him, he presented himself at Longton Police Station. While Green was being questioned, Mr Wilshaw had checked what had actually been stolen from the property. 21 items were missing. Among them were four expensive ladies' rings, a platinum and diamond ladies' wristwatch, an emerald and diamond bracelet, a gold cigarette case, 20 pounds in notes, and strangely, a man's RAF greatcoat which had three cigarette burns in it. After interviewing Green and listening to his alibi, that he was at his girlfriend Nora Lammy's house in Leeds at the time of the murder, Superintendent Stockley, even though noticing how calm and thoroughly likeable Green was, also could see something in his eyes. A way he sometimes looked at you, there was something not right in that look. Stockley realised that even though he believed they had got their man, they would need help in breaking his alibi in Leeds and also searching for the missing greatcoat, which Stockley believed was also key to the investigation. He regretfully, but believing it was for the greater good, decided they would have to call in Scotland Yard for the extra help they could give them. Detective Superintendent Reg Spooner and Detective Sergeant Ernest Millen of the Yard arrived at Longton to interview Green. They also found the man a thoroughly likeable chap, but there was still something about him that didn't sit right, and they too agreed with Staffordshire Police that this was indeed their man. And with his extra resources, Spooner instructed his team to go out and interview Green's wife and his girlfriend and any other friends and family. He also got the railway police to investigate lost property at all stations that did or could connect Barlaston, Stafford and Leeds to track down this missing RAF coat. And by studying the train timetables, also pieced together the missing hour between Alice Wilshaw receiving a phone call and her husband finding her dead body. Green's initial statement also started to change now. A Charles and Lorenzo that he knew, also small-time burglars, came into the story. They had allegedly asked him, questions about the rich couple's home where he worked. He refused to give them any information at the time as he said he enjoyed the job and didn't want to lose it. But he happened to bump into them again after he had been fired and may, he said, have regretfully mentioned some things but not exactly how to break in. But weirdly he asked the pair if they could get him a couple of rings for his girlfriend. The day after the murder of Alice Wilshaw, he ran into Charles and Lorenzo again, and he, of course, not yet knowing anything about the murder of Mrs Wilshaw, accepted two rings, a gold cigarette case and £15 in cash from the very generous Charles and Lorenzo, considering that he hadn't helped in the crime in any way. At the same time, dogged work by the railway police unearthed the RAF greatcoat actually still on the train that someone would have had to have used in the time frame of the murder. The blood on the outside of the coat was indeed Alice's blood group, but inside the coat on the cuff was blood of Green's group, corresponding exactly with where Green had sustained a cut to his wrist. But just as importantly, a ticket had been handed in to a ticket collector for the time of the murder and a time where Green had no alibi apart from when, in his words, he was sleeping off a lunchtime drinking session on a bench in a Stafford Park. Customers at the station hotel where he was staying, bizarrely under the name of Cuthbert Wilshire of Estoril, the mind boggles, 
said they saw him leave at 3.30pm and returned three hours later. His girlfriend in Leeds, Nora Lamy, when questioned, also gave the police the two rings that Green, who had told her his name was Terence, had given her, and of course they were Alice Wilshaw's rings taken from her dead fingers. The evidence against Green was mostly circumstantial, but was fitting together perfectly. The very unusual horizontal shoe pattern on the footprints found in the kitchen turned out to be from shoes made in Mallorca, a pair of which Green owned and were probably the only pair in North Staffordshire at the time. The ticket that showed he would have had time to murder Alice and get to his girlfriend's in Leeds. The great coat on that train with Alice's blood group on the outside and his group on the inside which corresponded where he had sustained an injury to his wrist. The gloves and where they had a cut in them and in the same place he had a cut in his thumb. The rings off Alice's fingers given to Nora Lamy and the fact that no Charles and Lorenzo could ever be traced. Leslie Green went to trial at Stafford Aziz's on December the 3rd, 1952, before Judge Justice Sable. The trial lasted three days. Green took the whole trial in his stride, seemingly accepting his fate, but still continuing to plead his innocence. Nobody who met him had a bad word for him. Even though he had been terribly abused physically and sexually as a boy and started pilfering early, which led to him spending time in Borstal, prison for children, he was still known as being kind, gentle and funny, albeit a jack the lad and a bit of a small-time criminal. Leslie Green was found guilty of the murder of Alice Wilshaw and was hanged by Albert Pierpoint at Winsome Jail two days before Christmas in 1952. Now there are people out there that still don't think Leslie committed the crime and all efforts to reopen the case have been denied up to now. I've got to say I thought the evidence looked pretty damning. But I'm wondering if he may have been suffering from some sort of schizophrenia where he didn't even realise that he had committed the murder. Some of the things I've read about this case, most of it too long for this bedtime story, pointed to that theory. But I guess we will never know. Anyway, it's now that time again where those of you who are either sick of my Lincolnshire twang or have fallen asleep halfway through and are going or have gone. And here we are with the little gang of murder at bedtime masochists. And you know I think you are amazing. So here's a bit of waffle. I hope you're enjoying the beautiful weather we're having at the moment. I, at the weekend, jumped on a coach and went to Rye in Sussex. What a fantastic town. I decided to take no equipment to do a video for my other YouTube channel, The Exiled Yellowbelly. I was just going to have a nice, chilled out ramble around the old buildings, drink some cider, eat some fish and chips and have some ice cream. But I was there a matter of minutes before I heard of a famous old murder in the town. So with just my phone in hand, I bought a book on it read up on it in the graveyard and went jerkily around video in the story. Now I'm going to edit it and put it up on the Murder at Bedtime YouTube channel probably next week as an extra. It won't be a long, long one. So if you'd like to listen to it on podcast as well, I'll put it up on the podcast too as an extra. It won't be a long one, as I say. I hope all the dads out there in the UK had a great Father's Day. I had a great one. My daughter, Keita took me out for breakfast, then somehow we managed to spend five hours outside a cafe, the splendid Esquires at Berryfields, Ellsbury, chatting about demons, ghosts, witches, black masses and murders. 
throw in a chat about tattoos and superheroes as well, and the time flew by. Now, the Exiled Yellow Belly, my other channel, is going on a little holiday stroke tour. I'm going to go to Norfolk for a few days and I'm going to video all their interesting spooky stuff. Well, as much as I can. I may even pop into Norwich to see Stolen From Me, lovely Lindsay. Anyway, I think that's enough for me. Sorry I took a bit longer this time, but I will try to do better. Stay safe, take good care of yourselves and chat again soon. Bye-bye.